Good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today to, to talk to everybody and to engage in this conversation with Tan Tansy Hoskins. I'm Victoria Robinson. I'm Professor of Sociology and Director of the Centre for Women's Studies here at the University of York. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to be asked to chair Tansy's talk, as I said, um, partly because my own research as a sociologist of fashion and footwear has been very much involved with um, looking at how people use shoes, dispose of them, how shoes challenge them and change their identities. And reading Tansy's book took me into a whole new level of debate around, around footwear. Um, so just before I hand over to her, uh, I just wanted to say that today's event is part of York's Festival of Ideas Online. It's in a very different format to usual. But the positive side of that is, of course, we have a global audience now for all our ideas that the festival has been promoting. Uh, the 2020 festival has over 40 online, event, uh, online events, offering a very inspiring programme. Um, and thanks very much for, for, for joining us today. And we hope you very much enjoy the talk. A few technical notes just, just before we begin. Um, if you're watching live, you can ask questions through the question and answer button, which is on your screen. It's available throughout the whole talk, so questions can be asked at any time. If you've got any technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can always rejoin the event using the original link that you were given. And also, of course, remember that today's event is recorded, so you'll be able to, to watch it again. But I'd like to turn to Tansy now. She's going to talk for around roughly around half an hour, and Tansy and I are going to engage in conversation. Um, and then we'll have question and answers from the audience. It takes us deep into the heart of this industry and it reveals a number of issues. One of them is centrally how workers are exploited, but also how consumers may be deceived in terms of purchasing their shoes. Um, her book is available on sale. Uh, you can get it at Fox Lane Books and you'll be given a link later where you can get that. So over to Tansy. Hello. Um, I hope everybody can uh, see and hear me okay. This is, as you can imagine, quite a surreal experience. Um, not to be able to see um, any of you, it makes, it makes a big change. But I, I just want to say thank you so much to York Festival of Ideas and, uh, and to say congratulations to them on the crisis management that has seen them transform the festival and put it onto a digital platform. Um, and thank you so much to Vicky Robinson as well. So um, as Vicky said, my name is Tansy Hoskins. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your questions about the global footwear industry, um, about my work and about the, the book Footwork um, as well. Um, if, you, if you're feeling shy, you can find me after the event I'm on Twitter and Instagram um, at Tansy Hoskins and also on Facebook at Tansy Hoskins author page. So if you have any questions in the future, if you're studying in this area or doing research in this area, do feel free uh, to reach out in, in the future. So um, here we are and uh, let's talk about shoes. So to begin with, it's important to note that humans are the only known species to, that uses shoes as protection from the cold uh, and from dangerous ground. And the creation of shoes is linked to our evolution um, as a species, and it has really had a fundamental impact on our species. And so go, you know, going back, rewinding back and back and back through time, over hundreds of millions of years, the human body evolved from that of our primate forebears. We began to support all our weight on two feet rather than four feet, and we began walking and running in an upright position. Now, it's important to imagine, if you can, the, you know, the, the inhospitable landscapes of the ancient world, so the ice caps and the burning deserts and the poisonous insects and the, uh, all the things that wanted to, um, wanted to hunt uh, human beings and, and chase them down. So this move, this evolution, evolutionary move to bipedal mo locomotion uh, placed an awful lot of strain on our feet until eventually 
one of our long, 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 long lost ancestors had the bright idea of wrapping a bit of bark around her feet to help her do the things that she needed to do. So to help her run faster after prey, to help her run away from all those predators, to help her avoid the poisonous bites and stings. And of course, having some protection for your feet meant that human beings were able to cross ice caps and cross burning deserts and uh, find new places uh, to live. And one of the people that I, whose research I really enjoyed in the book is a, a man called uh, Dr. Eric Trinkhouse. And Dr. Trinkhouse is a paleoanthropologist, and it's his opinion that human beings started wearing shoes about 40,000 years ago. And this was a difficult thing for him to figure out because there's not much left from 40,000 years ago. And the types of things that people were making shoes from back then, you know, like literally pieces of bark uh, and reeds, uh, this is all this has all disappeared except for a few examples so what he did instead was to examine the toes of human remains and it was this that led him to believe that human beings have been wearing shoes for about 40,000 years because previously to 40,000 years we had pretty sturdy toes after 40,000 years um, our toes got flimsy and he believes that this was the, this is the result of the, the splinting and protection that, that came from footwear. So made from bark and reeds and uh, cowhide, shoes were invented at the dawn of human history and they have been with us ever since. For tens of thousands of years, shoes remained humble objects made locally and cheaply by community shoemakers. And Interestingly, shoes also came to be associated with magic. The ancient Greek philosopher Strabo told, tells a tale or told the tale of Rodolphus, this beautiful courtesan who uh, went for a swim in a river one day and an eagle swooped down and stole one of her sandals that was on the riverbank. And the eagle flew off with her sandal and dropped it into the lap of a pharaoh. And the legend goes that the pharaoh was so enamoured, so taken by the shape, just the shape of this beautiful shoe, that he sent his emissaries out to find the woman that this shoe belonged to. And eventually he married the, the beautiful uh, courtesan. We also see a similar tale in ancient China, where a feisty young woman uh, battled against her enemies, this time a wicked stepmother and some wicked stepsisters in order to win the heart of a of a prince and in this she was aided by a magical fish and the fish created for her a pair of shoes that were patterned with with fish scales but it's, it's not just ancient greece and ancient china the interesting thing is is that in native american culture javanese russian zulu and persian we always find a tale about a feisty young woman who was aided by her shoes and helped to raise her social station. Now, in 1697, this story was written down in Paris. It was written down as the story of Cendrillion and it was very much sanitized. So some of the folklore elements, the feistiness of the woman and the, the chopped off toes that were in some of the versions and the ghosts and the blood and the guts and the gore was sanitized and removed. And eventually this story uh, developed and became a bit more pathetic, to be honest, and, and eventually ended up being the, um, the story of Cinderella, um, as told uh, by Disney. But of course, shoes and magic, it's not just Cinderella. You have um, Hermes, the god, the Greek god with his winged sandal. You, of course, you have Dorothy and her ruby slippers and you have the seven league boots that enabled the, uh, the wearer to, to travel seven leagues with every single step. So where you find shoes, you will often find magic. And yet, shoes are not magic. They are just pieces of plastic and leather and rubber and foam and metal and more plastic all tightly bonded and stitched together. So I wrote footwork in order to try and ask 
our shoes real questions and to listen to the stories that they can tell us and not just to listen to the fairy tales that have been written down about them. And for many years, for hundreds and, or hundreds and thousands of years, the design of a shoe and the definition of a shoe is simply a covering for a foot that doesn't reach above the ankle. So the design of shoes has not changed very much at all, but the production of shoes in the 21st century and their impact on the world around us is unrecognizable from ancient times. So no matter how much the shoe industry would have us believe that they do, shoes do not magically appear out of a puff of pink smoke. Quite the contrary, in fact. The footwear industry has become a mighty industrial monster that in 2018 produced 66.3 million pairs of shoes per day. Among the first objects to undergo globalized production, shoes represent the interdependencies and the injustices that now shape our world. 66.3 million pairs of shoes per day, which adds up to a total of 24.2 billion per year. Now, you might be wondering where all of these shoes uh, are being made. And the short answer is China. Uh, again, in 2018, China produced 64.7% of all shoe production, and there is literally no other country that comes close to rivaling this figure. Other key producers are Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, Mexico, Brazil, India, and Pakistan. And interestingly, more recently, Ethiopia is becoming established as a shoemaking hub as brands search and search for lower and lower labor costs. And in Ethiopia, it is extraordinarily low. The minimum, baseline, the minimum baseline wage for that sector, for textile clothing and footwear sector, is $26 per, per month. Imagine, yeah, literally just imagine trying to live off $26 per month. And, Eastern Europe has also become a key production site for shoes that are then exported to the rest of Europe. And I'd like to read for, for you a brief passage from Footwork, which, is, uh, which will take you inside a shoe factory in Macedonia that I visited in May 2018. Gonna have a little sip of water. So here we are, we're going inside a shoe factory. Through a set of double doors is a shoe factory staffed by workers in matching red t-shirts. All but a few are women. They are bent over workstations around a green conveyor belt. The workers take pieces of shoes out of green baskets attached to the belt. Completing their task, they return the pieces to the basket as it moves on to the next station. The conveyor belt moves slowly, but it never stops. Everyone must work in tandem. In a corner office is the founder and boss of the DeMarco Dual factory. Lydia Milanovska is dressed in slim cut black trousers and black high heels. She has long dark nails and short chestnut hair. On a shelf is a miniature bucket of shoe shaped lollipops. Her computer screen shows CCTV of the factory floor. Lydia describes her factory as in the middle in terms of Macedonian standards. There are, she says, both better and worse factories. The factory makes 300 shoe uppers a day. For complicated models, output drops to 200, but simple models like sandals can be churned out at a rate of 400 per day. Lydia pays the workers 200 to 350 euros per month, depending on their role in factory. In their rows, the workers sew and snip and glue and solder, repeating their task hundreds of times a day. The sewing machines whir and stop, whir and stop. A woman positions a machine above a bolt of leather, then lowers it to cut out templates. In a cupboard-sized room, a woman in a mask screen prints logos onto tiny ovals of silver leather, ready for a pliqueing. Fumes sting my eyes and nose. The windows are open, but I cannot see any other ventilation system. Large metal containers of glue are stacked next to shelves of thread. Each container is printed with a flammable warning sign in bright red. A woman 
as a burning candle next to an open pot of glue a few meters away. She is using the flame to singe the edges of shoe templates. At another workstation, a coffee pot balances on a small gas stove. There is just one way into the factory. I worry that if a factory started, the only way out for the workers at the back of this long rectangular room would be to jump out of the first floor window. So there you have it. That's a, that's a, typical, a typical shoe factory. Um, scruffy conditions, extremely low paid workers, air that literally hurts to, uh, to breathe. Um, and I, I would just think, I would encourage you to like take a look at the shoes that you own and just look at the label and see if the label even tells you which country your, uh, your shoes were made in. Um, if you're lucky, you might, you might just get that information. Um, so shoe supply chains are long, they are complex, they are international and they are very hard to follow and to monitor. And part of the reason is because a single shoe can be made from between 30 to 40 different component parts plastics from oil, foams that will last a thousand years in landfill. But there is one material that I want to focus on today because I think it does deserve special attention and that is leather. And having written a book on the shoe industry, I can tell you that the leather, leather supply chains are a disaster from start to finish. For example, you might not think that your shoes have anything to do with the Amazon rainforest being cut down but they quite possibly do. The Amazon rainforest, as we all know, is a wondrous place. It houses 10% of the world's known species. The Amazon River runs for 6,600 kilometers, a river and a rainforest that are the lungs of the world. And yet this rainforest is being cut down with the number one cause of Amazon deforestation being cattle farming. Billions and billions of animals, billions of cows, who are bred, who are cruelly mistreated, and then who are horrifically slaughtered in order to create meat and leather. And I must add, if anyone is in any doubt, and having visited a slaughterhouse for the research in this book, that there is no humane way to slaughter an animal when it does not want to be killed. And then you have the next problem. And the next problem is that when an animal is killed, what you have is a pile of rotting skin, which you, if you're a shoe manufacturer, you need to prevent it from rotting even further. And you do this through an extremely intensive chemical process. And in one country in particular, in Bangladesh, this chemical process, this turning of skin into leather has spelt utter ecological disaster. The tannery industry in Bangladesh has created the fifth most polluted place on the planet. The chemicals used to tan leather include chromium, including chromium-6, which if you've seen the brilliant film Erin Brockovich, you'll know as hexavalent chromium, sulfur dioxide, formic acid, and ammonium chloride. And so great are the dangers in this process. And this was one of the st statistics that, you know, has just stuck with me uh, from, you know, right from the start of writing footwork. So great are the dangers in the tannery business. That one study found that tannery workers had a 90% chance of being dead by the age of 50. And all of this, just so that shoe brands can source cheap leather. Although I would argue, and I'm sure you would all agree with me, that it's, it's not cheap if someone has had to die uh, to make it. So workers with a 90% chance of being dead by the age of 50 and the Buri Ganja River, this enormous wide river, is wide, you know, wider than the Thames that runs through the capital city, Dhaka, the Buri Ganja River being declared biologically dead due to the chemical runoff from these, um, from these tanneries. And this is why I argue, and this is why I wanted to write footwork. You know, we, we must listen to more than just fairy tales when it, when it comes to our, to our shoes. 
we must interrogate shoes and their supply chains to reveal the stories about where they have come from. Leather from Brazil and leather from Bangladesh is produced for export. It fills the shops of rich and powerful brands in Europe, in America and the UK. So my question is, what would your shoes tell you? They could tell you about the 66.3 million other shoes that were created on the same day as them. They could tell you about the harsh life of a, in, within a Chinese or Macedonian factory or they could tell you about the leather workers who waded through poison. But what if your shoes wanted to tell you a story of migration that had been driven by terror and by loss? My other question is if your shoes wanted to tell you such a story, would you still really want to know where they came from? And this was, this brings me to a, one of the other extremely disturbing bits of research that I did for Stitched Up. Um, I've been writing about the fashion, um, clothing, textile industry for about 10 years, uh, but I wasn't prepared for some of the stuff that I found within the footwear industry. And it's important to note that the, the, the footwear industry is about 10 years behind the rest of the fashion industry in terms of standards, in terms of transparency, um, and in terms of conditions for the people who, who work in it. And this is partly because there hasn't been a, uh, a tragedy uh, um, of, within the footwear industry of the scale that there was in the garment industry when Rana Plaza factory collapse happened in 2013. And if you don't know about that, that is uh, April 2013, an eight-storey building that housed numerous garment factories in, in, in Bangladesh collapsed in on itself and uh, 1,138 people were killed and thousands more were, uh, were permanently injured. Um, so there hasn't been something like that within the footwear industry, even though there has, have been fatal factory collapses and fatal factory fires um, as well. But there hasn't been something like Rana Plaza. So there is just far, far less of a spotlight on the shoe industry. And the supply chains for shoes are just, they're more complicated. You know, as I was saying, like um, your average shoe can have 30 plus different uh, component parts to it. So that it's really, it's hard to trace. And so one of the things, the most disturbing things that I found researching the book was for the chapter on migration. Um, and that's the, the, the next thing I just want to tell you about. So when the war broke out in Syria in 2011, millions of people fled across the border to Turkey. And Turkey just happens to be a key global producer of clothes and of shoes. And you might have seen the Turkish, Turkish industry in the news lately, as uh, the British government has um, struggled and failed to um, come up with proper PPE for our NHS staff. So you've had thousands of refugees coming over the border and half of the 2.5 million employees within Turkey's textile, clothing and footwear industries um, are informal workers. And many of these informal workers are now refugees. And in order to have a roof over their head and to have food on the table, many Syrian refugee families have had to send their children into the shoe industry, uh, with the result that Syrian refugee children as young as six have been found stitching shoes together in Turkey. Now, this is a hardcore environment for adults, let alone for children. So hours typically range from, you know, workers, they start at 7 a.m., Maybe they go on until 10 p.m. Maybe they go on until midnight. Um, you have children working with toxic glues, with cutting knives and with flammable solvents. Um, you also have children facing uh, physical and emotional abuse and in some cases sexual abuse at the hands um, of these workshop and small factory owners. And like I say, like this is this it's a tough gig for adults let alone for children, and yet the children are hired because they can be paid less 
you know, they will take home a, a wage of between 25 to 35 pounds per month. And once again, I think it's really important to note that these are shoes often for export, you know, export to the UK, to Germany and to Italy. And I think one of the cruelest ironies in the supply chains is the fact that the shoes can cross the borders once they're once they've been made they cross the border into Europe and they're welcomed you know they're welcomed by the multinational corporations they're welcomed by the people who want to buy them but the children the refugee children who stitch them together are not welcomed so the flow of capital and the flow of products is allowed but desperate children are barred from crossing over uh, into Europe so these are some of the very real stories that shoes tell us about the world that we live in. Stories that are obscured by empty labels, by slick branding, by celebrity endorsements and fancy adverts. I just, I think it's really important that we never lose sight of what is behind these labels and these celebrity endorsements and that we work together to fight back against these issues of overproduction, 66.3 million pairs every day, the environmental destruction, you know, the chopping down of the rainforest and the desecration of, of rivers, the flood of chemicals and the appalling treatment of people whose hands, human hands, which stick to, stitch together the world that we take for granted. And at the end of the day, for me, I think, you know, we must ask who is this system really working for? Is it designed to feed and shelter and enrich people's lives while we all live in harmony with the biosphere? Or is it designed for something else? And I think there are a lot of big questions about capitalism, but the simplest ones hold the key. Is it worth destroying the rainforest to make trainers? Is it right that factories churn out 24.2 billion pairs of shoes a year, yet wealth is distributed so unequally that tens of thousands of kids get sick walking barefoot to school? Should children tanning leather have a life expectancy of 50? If in our hearts we know the answer to these questions is no, then we have to ask ourselves what we are doing in a system that says the answer is yes. The economy, the globalized shoe production system, and the wider economy is currently designed to prioritize profit-fueled overproduction and overconsumption, rather than a dignified life for us all. I think we could redesign it to switch these priorities and to immediately get rid of some of the worst practices that we see, because with different concerns would come different results. So I want to leave you with this thought, our shoes have been with us for 40,000 years. They have both witnessed and propelled our journey through the ages, beholding humanity at its best and at its worst. So perhaps they are as good an object as any to lead us into a brighter and fairer future. If not, they should be a reminder that in them, we carry the world. Vicky. Hi, thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Um, and I think you, you made the, the humble shoe um, an object of, of, of scrutiny um, for so many different reasons. Um, from, you know, on a personal level, what we have in our wardrobes, how we wear our shoes, but on that kind of, importantly, that global scale, the global north, the global south. I know a lot of your research in the book went all over the world for, um, for, for, for talking to people, getting their views on working in the industry, what, what they felt about the, the being consumers of shoes. So the political, I think what you've outlined really well, and in half an hour, you've done a great job, the political, the economic, the environmental aspects of shoe wearing. One of the things, and I can see we've got an awful lot of questions coming in. So some of the questions I think that we'll, 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 we'll have discussed, but there'll be others coming up in the audience question and answer after our short discussion. But you, you said in your talk that there are around 63.3 million pairs of shoes manufactured per day, which is an absolutely staggering number. 
And I think probably a lot of the audience, as well as myself, is wondering what actually happens to those shoes, how they're disposed of, what are the implications of that number of shoes being disposed of? Yeah, well, that is so that uh, that's an entirely new within the, that's on shoe recycling at Loughborough University, and they said that ninety percent of shoes are not recycled. So we're producing sixty six million every day and 90 percent of them are are not recycled and that's for that's for several reasons i mean so a shoe as i was saying is a very complex object um it's 30 to 40 different materials all very very tightly bonded together so it's very difficult to take it apart um, and it's also very difficult to separate out all of the different um different materials again and also all of the materials that make up a shoe they're all very low value it's not like a circuit board where maybe you've got some copper you know um, or gold even like these are very very low uh, value objects and um, a lot of shoes have a metal shank along the like a, along the sole as well which which is really really hard to shred so uh, so it's quite it's quite a conundrum and it's one that the um the shoe industry, the shoe manufacturers and the shoe brands have really washed their hands off. Like they don't, they don't pay any attention to the end of life of a shoe. Like their entire business model is built on get, you know, getting the shoe into the shop and getting the shoe to the consumer. And like, and that's where they make their money. And after that, they're just like, yeah, like not my problem. And so, you know, we like so they, so it's a very underfunded area of research mm -hmm. uh, there just aren't the facilities available for for recycling shoes so yeah 90 percent of shoes don't get recycled they go into landfill or they get incinerated that, that's that's really interesting because one of the things that i picked up reading your book was that even though as we know the fashion industry is is at the beginning of a journey to be more responsible in terms of its working practices uh, the global implications, its environmental impact. The fashion industry seems to have picked up on these things quicker than the shoe industry. And I, I wondered why why you think that might be. Oh, I think there's just there's not the same social pressure on brands, on shoe brands, as there is on on uh, on fashion brands. Like I feel like there's a good you know there's a good conversation happening about clothing and ethics and in, environmental ethics in particular. But that conversation kind of stops at our ankles and anything going on underneath our ankles, like, you know, there just isn't in that conversation. Okay, so. that, that's interesting. Um, and I, I just wanted to also kind of perhaps, I mean, the, 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 the thrust of the book is, is around the political, the economic, the environmental, and that's, I think that's absolutely essential to think about this industry in so many different ways and ask some difficult questions as you, as you have done. But how important do you think it is to recognise people's emotional attachment to shoes, the way that people construct their identity? The research that I did was, was very much looking at how people use shoes to transform themselves from the everyday into sometimes something very magical and extraordinary. People have have fierce attachments to their shoes, sometimes even more than their clothes. So if we're concerned with the shoe industry, how do people's emotions and attachments figure in how we change that? Mm. No, so, like, yeah, so, it's, a, it's a great question and an and a endlessly fascinating area of research um, as well. I mean, like I completely agree, people do have deep emotional connections to their shoes like you know they they, they can remember uh mm. you know like the shoe that the shoe that someone gets married in or the shoe that someone goes on the first date in or you know or graduates in or like you know or runs a marathon in or what like or, or what you know or climbs a mountain in like it's it's very very hard for people to to get rid of shoes um, but I, I think we need, I think that, that is a really important part of going forward and transforming the industry is allowing people to have these like special, you know, special attachments and special relationships 
with the objects like around them um, but allowing people the time to kind of invest in the in those objects rather than pushing them all the time to buy new ones mm. that they don't need which i think is one of the really negative aspects of the footwear industry is that the it's not it's not about valuing what we have and like enjoying those emotional connections with what we have it's you know it's all about telling us that what we have is you know is meaningless and that we need we need new things so mm. that sounds like a reason to question the capitalist need for profit in terms of buying consuming replacing replenishing buying again and starting that whole whole, whole cycle off um, and it actually leads me to to another question which is if i mean you've revealed a number of really shocking things and some of the audience will already know some of these things and, and some of them won't um, and i guess you know how, how do you think we can potentially change the shoe industry um, just to follow up before you answer that i noticed in the book that you talked about people's personal change so personal changes in consumption habits but also changes more from governments and this is we're talking about global government here as well aren't we um, so i wondered how you how you felt about whether change comes from the personal and how we consume our shoes or whether it comes from governments mm -hmm. well i think i mean I, I yeah i think i do think eventually it's it's both um i think there's you know i hope that a lot of the work that i do is is about sort of political education and kind of um giving people the tools to 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 sort of think about shoes and and, and clothing in like in a more political way in a more conscious way so and like and arming people giving people the tools to go out and make conscious decisions about what they're buying um and to like you know to move from a kind of mindless caught up in the system to a, like to a more considered like awake uh like state state of being so I, I you know i definitely think there's nothing there's nothing wrong with buying the most the most ethical shoes that you can but at the same time like that is that 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 ability the ability to do that mm. ability to spend you know 150 pounds on a pair of shoes is not something that's open to like to everyone so i'm also really interested in um in pathways to change that you know that can that do include everyone um and i think that is where you know that's where political change comes in because honestly like just like the tobacco industry and just like the oil industry, I, I think that fashion corporations and footwear corporations should be held to account for the damage that they inflict on our planet and the damage that they inflict on people. You know, I, I can't, like, to me, that's like, that's just common sense. And we're not going to get to that point just by shopping differently. We're going to get to that point through, as you say, getting as a first step, some global legislation that actually has teeth and that can hold um, corporations to account. Because at the moment, it's, it's like the Wild West out there. You know, they, they hop from country to country, polluting and, um, and you know, and destroying lives as, as they please. And, and we just, like, we can't afford for it to carry on like this. And perhaps, thank you, a really um, comprehensive answer. And just maybe a, a last question before we um, go over to audience questions. And I've, I've got a little thing flashing up on my screen saying there's already 32 questions. So I'll apologize in advance for not getting to every one, but hopefully some of them have already been, been dealt with to an extent. But just in, in terms of um, COVID-19, we can't have a session without mentioning that. Um, and there's two issues around there, I think one is do you think what's what's the impact the pandemics had on the global footwear industry but also are there different ways of thinking that have perhaps started to emerge of course we're not fully aware of what they are yet but how we might feel and think differently and act differently in the future you know what what how do we check you know how whether whether covid's allowed us to to think differently yeah i i hope i mean i hope covid 19 has made people think differently i mean it's been it's been quite upsetting to be honest with you being a, like a like a fashion 
like working within like the sphere of fashion uh, during COVID-19 because it's just um, really re-exposed all the inequalities within the industry. And I mean, the, um, you know, the, you have these like giant multinational corporations run by literally some of the richest people on the planet. And they already put all the risk and all the burden on just onto uh, factories in the global south like they don't own their factories they subcontract so they already don't have any risk and then when covid-19 struck the fashion industry's response to covid-19 was to cut and run mm -hmm. from shoe factories and from garment factories that were already carrying like these huge levels of risk and we're already operating on a, a shoestring budget with you know tens of thousands of workers who literally live hand to mouth and um and, and the fashion industry responded by like refusing to pay for orders some of which had already been finished some of which were already sitting on the key side in america uh, and and europe and the fashion brands were like well we're just we're not going to pay for this you know or like threatening um fashion uh, factory owners in places like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and saying well okay like we will pay for what we ordered but we but we want a 50% discount and like and they're just there isn't the margins for a 50% discount um, uh, so yeah so it's been it's been a pretty horrible uh, like yeah very horrible few months and um, whilst you know it is really important that like uh, so reducing the amount of clothes and shoes that we make is definitely going to be part of the you know a global green new deal like we have to reduce production but we truly need the opposite of what has happened in like during covid-19 i mean it, like it's been it's been carnage like a like really awful carnage um the opposite of any kind of just transition that you know that we that we need to see okay Thank you. I, I think that that takes us neatly onto our question and answers. And as I said, there's an awful lot of questions. Um, I'm just looking at some of them now. Um, I have to say, there's quite a few um, people saying how much they've enjoyed the talk, and particularly the kind of the passion and the moral imperative that you you obviously have towards to, towards this issue. And the questions are ranging. It seems from um, people wanting to know how they can do things differently. Um, to, uh, I mean, there's one here, it's from Lizzie. She says, what do you think of vegan shoes that are made of plastic instead of leather? She says, I work in costume on film and, in film and TV, and we use so many shoes for extras, we actually rent them. And she says, on our last job before lockdown, we had 500 for one day. Wow. Wow. I mean, like, um, like ve vegan shoes are far more exciting than just plastic now. I think that is one, like, one of the things that, you know, I think is is inevitable for for a you know for a just a, a better society is the move to plant based materials and and like that yeah that's just something that's really quite exciting like definitely I mean plastic yeah plastic's not good but today you know you've got um, like mushroom m mushroom leather um, you've got pineapple uh, stuff made from pineapple leaves and pineapple skin uh, you've got tea leather. All, like all sorts you know recycled fishing nets um and like yeah and and so on so i think i think vegan footwear is is an exciting branch of the footwear industry and is yeah it needs to needs to move beyond plastic definitely okay there's a question from uh, diane who says it's often the that the onus is put on the consumer to make the right decision but do you know what, I mean, she said the government, it could be the UK government, it could be other governments. Are there any governments doing anything about this to make corporations more accountable for their actions? Um, I mean, there are, like, there are moves uh, within the European Union um, and, like, and ge like ge there are moves within Germany in particular to try and regulate things. Um, but it's yes, yeah, it's, it's very different. It's, it's difficult because it always comes down to kind of which bit of the shoe supply chain do you you know do we want to regulate? Like, and which issue within the shoe supply chain do you want to regulate? So it's like it's, it's basically impossible to get a kind of fair trade sticker 
as we do with fruit with fruit and you know chocolate and things which have much more simple supply chains um but yeah yeah so so it's complicated so not like nobody's nobody's doing enough basically uh but you know the the ILO are pushing for for things um yeah Germany's got some interesting initiatives they've got a thing called the green button which like which they which they're trialing um yeah off the top of my head that's that's what comes to mind okay and it's a, a kind of related question but from uh Nishathri who says if shoe brands aren't designing their products for end of life are they at least designing them for repairability so is, is that is that an option that you know it's part of that capitalist thing of throwaway culture isn't it how, how do we address that yeah well so so um the 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 elephant in the room with with uh, shoe repair is trainers is like is sneakers because they just you know they're just not built for for repair and you generally you need like quite a specialist cobbler who who can or you know will uh, repair uh, repair a pair like repair a pair of trainers um so yes yeah no, um i mean what i would like to see is more kind of modular design so shoes that were created to replace just the bit that needed replacing um i'd love to see subsidies for shoe repair i think that would be like a wonderful thing so that so that it was no longer more expensive to get your favorite beloved pair of shoes fixed mm. than to just go down to you know to the high street and buy a, another pair so i think yeah like so yeah subsidies for people and like the reskilling of, of people throughout society i think is is a really would be a really interesting thing like making it more you know more more courses from you know in schools and colleges and community centers just about how to fix everything around us fix our electronics mend our clothes and how to fix our shoes you know stuff just to like empower us as well i think would be would be exciting yeah exactly uh, there's a really interesting question from bernice and it's one that um i just possibly say a little bit on before i pass it over and she says as you said shoes have evolved from being developed for protection and health and safety but ironically in the modern world shoes are far from practical they, they don't necessarily offer protection they can be high heels that you know we work with podiatrists podiatrists in, in, in our own research my, my research with jenny hockey and and and, and the podiatrists were going podiatrists were going crazy because women particularly were wearing high heels and and they were crippling their feet but actually she, I, I, what, what i would say to bernice and I, I don't know what you would say is that actually shoes aren't just about health and they're not just about safety and they're not just about getting from what a to the other they're about so much more and that's why we wear shoes that aren't necessarily good for our feet and I, I don't know I don't know what you think about that yes like it's a crazy one because I mean like as you say like there is there is no medical doubt that high heels are extremely damaging to the body if you wear them a lot like they damage your feet your knees your pelvis they can all you know they can even um, uh, like damage your your reproductive capacity as a, as a woman like they are like they're in they're a, a, a nightmare a physiological nightmare and yet yes people do keep keep wearing them i mean i think uh, what i'm really opposed to is where there are rules that says that women have to wear high heels mm. i really hate that kind of yeah. thing where whether it's like cabin crew have to wear high heels or people working in in harrods or you know or, or select shops have to wear high heels or um you know i loved the the protest that julia roberts did on the red carpet at can where she mm. went barefoot because the rule the stupid rule is that women have to wear high heels on mm. the red carpet so um yeah so there's a lot of a lot of yeah like a a lot of pressure um around that and i really liked um one thing that there's a um, shoe curator elizabeth semelhack over in Canada when I interviewed her about high heels and she was like you know one thing she was like if um if high heels really were empowering then men would wear, like men would wear them and it's just like, it's like you know she she hits the nail on the head there but but yeah definitely I mean shoes shoes aren't just about practicality like they are about like if you're lucky yeah you you could you use them to create your identity and to um to match your like your emotional need and to send out signals about yourself like 
into the world. Mm. Yeah, ab 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 absolutely. Um, just to, to turn maybe to a, a question um, around the environment um, and, and, and looking at it in, in, a, in, a, in a bigger sense. There's a question from, from Mary Donoghue who says, can the toxic runoff from the tanneries be treated before being expelled into rivers? And I don't know that I don't know whether that's a question you can answer. It's quite specific, but it seems to me an example of of how something can be done practically on a more global scale. No, absolutely. Um, so, so there's a new there's a new initiative in Bangladesh. So um, things got like things got so bad, like you know, no regulation. I mean, literally the fifth most polluted place on the planet in the Haziri Bag. It was complete chaos, and mm -hmm. so. Um, the Bangladeshi government built a, uh, an industrial park and it included Bangladesh's first like effluent treatment plant that was built by this like Chinese manufacturer. Cause yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, like, of course, like, yeah, there are systems for this. There's way, you know, we have things in, you can have things in place to prevent this. Um, but when I went, you know, I went through like a lot of high court documents from, from over in Bangladesh and, you know, like the, the treatment plant just like wasn't being turned on. It's supposed to run 24 hours. It wasn't being turned on. There were a lot of issues with the Chinese uh, corporation. Yeah, we, uh, disclaimer, which they denied. Uh, but there were, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of issues with, with, with the job that they did. There were different departments within the Bangladeshi government that were fighting with each other. And, and what happened was basically that um, this effluent just started pouring into a, a, a different river. Um, I can't remember the name of the river off the top of my head, but so instead of the Buriganja River uh, being destroyed, hang on, it was, yeah, it was in that, like, I, I'll have it, I'll, I'll look it up. Oh, yeah, the Dalishwari. So the Dalishwari River um, is now having untreated effluent dumped into it. So it's like, yes absolutely can stop this from happening and you know a lot of environmental campaigners um, within Bangladesh really want to see some support and help and, and money from the brands that source this leather from Bangladesh it's like come, like come and help with the with the clear up job like you know don't you got like don't just leave walk or you know take the leather and like walk away um, but yeah, as, as you can imagine, like that, the brands, the brands aren't interested in, in doing that and they've just left it. Uh, they, yeah, they've just left it all. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and a related, um, it, it, that, so that's an environmental issue in terms of, uh, and this is also an environmental issue. Um, one of the, one of the audience asked, what's the best thing to do with our old shoes? Ah, oh, excellent question. Get them repaired. <laughs> <laughs> um no i mean it's so it's hard like it's really hard um <coughs> if you donate them uh, if they're in good condition and you want to donate them one thing that it's really important to do is to like tie them or tape them together because what people don't realize is that loads of secondhand shoes that get given to charity end up being separated and then you just have like thousands of single shoes which um which are no good, yeah, well, very little use to to anyone. Um, there's a section, yeah, on that in, in footwork. But yeah, I mean, get, like, get them repaired, um, if, you know, if you can. Like, learn how to fix them yourself, upcycle them, um, get them repaired, or yeah, or donate them. Um, yeah, or try and, yeah, or tr like, tr tr try and, like, uh, investigate whether within your borough, your council is offering a shoe recycling service and if they are i'd be very interested to hear how it goes this ties in actually with a, a uh, it's a comment really from uh, christine appleton and she says some branches of clark's accept and use accept use shoes to recycle in association with unicef and the scheme is called shoe share although i think there, i've read recently there are implications about the economies of country it might even have been in your book what are the implications of economy so we've got clarks for example doing something like um trying to help um in terms of um in the environment and in terms of recycling shoes with unicef and the funds go to educate children in the stores um across copper Bay in york um it's about educating people it's about helping to recycle are there some downsides to that 
Is that a good uh, thing? Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, particularly like, like uh, countries in Eastern Africa, like really don't want or need any more of our secondhand mm. clothes or, or shoes. Um, you know, it's uh, it's really kind of decimated the factory system in like in Southern Africa and, and Eastern Africa uh, in, in particular. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, and you just have you now have these like enormous secondhand markets that are just full of like uh, just the, the, you know the things that have been disposed of in in Britain and, and America and and, and Europe. Um, and I, I think we've got to be careful of seeing donating stuff as a safety valve like because it's sort of it's very it comes it's a sort of like out of sight out of mind isn't it like you donate it and the people you donate it to tell you you know tell you you're doing a good thing and um and then there's just not much like uh yeah there's just no follow-up like you don't really know what happens to your shoes after that don't know whether yeah we like I mean are they really suitable for someone else to wear mm. like you know and, and are they like are, like are they going to help people or are they you know are they sending them to a uh, recycling plant in Germany or are they just incinerating them mm. okay like, and yeah, we need like yeah we need to know thank you I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap the questions there because we've only got a uh, uh, because we've only got a couple of minutes but we had over 40 questions. Sorry not to get to all of them. But I don't know how many are watching, but it must be a lot. And I think that absolutely goes to show um, how your book is, is so important for putting that, the humble shoe into the spotlight for so many different reasons. And, and I'd like to thank you for that. And if anyone is interested, um, you can, as we said at the beginning, you can purchase the book, uh, Fox Lane Books. Um, so I'd very much like to, to, to thank to, to thank to, to thank Tam uh, uh, to thank Tamsi, sorry, and to say that the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, and you can access that via the website. Um, and also to you know keep 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 getting involved with the festival. There's so much more things that um, are coming up which are absolutely wonderful. Whether they'll be as good as as, as this talk, as, as as good as Tamsi's talk, I don't know. Um, we shall have to see, but my, my understanding is there's going to be some great things coming up. And maybe one of the positive things from lockdown is we've actually, York Talks has got a wider audience than it would have done, you know, and, and that, that can only be a good thing. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for being here in the audience um, and particularly thank you to Tamsie.